Thank you. Welcome, everyone. This is the weekly TSC call. I uh, <laughs> recognize every name on the participant list. So I assume you know the drill. This is a public meeting. Everybody is welcome to join. I two conditions. Uh, the first one is to live by the antitrust policy, which keeps us out of trouble, and the uh, code of conduct, which you all know and love and live by. With that taken care of, we can move to the agenda. Um, in terms of announcements, there's not much this week. Um, the uh, except to remind everybody of the weekly newsletter, which of course everybody should make an effort to try to take advantage of. Is there any other announcements anybody wants to make at this point? If not, we can move forward. So there's a whole bunch of uh, quarterly reports that are due and now uh, overdue. We have one that was actually submitted. Thank you for doing that. The Bezu team uh, posted a report. Uh, there was one specific question they raised, which I put on the agenda. We will talk about it separately, which has to do with DCO. And um, other than that, I didn't see any other issues. Grace or Dano, is there anything you want to highlight beside the DCO issue? Uh, nothing on my uh, end, you know, just a typical quarter with progress being made. So all good things. But yeah, we can talk about DCO in a bit. All right. Yeah, Thank you. just DCO. OK. And um, so again, I mean, for those involved in those projects, Quilt, Explore, Avalon, all of those are due and overdue for several of them. So please get to it and get the word out if you know people who should have done it. All right. The next uh, report due is Cactus, by the way. So be ready for that one. It's due for next week. Uh, so there is, I didn't see anybody raising their hands. So I assume there is no question for the Bezu team either. And we can move forward with the agenda and get to the crux of this meeting, which is a presentation by Silas on the vent. Silas, you're there. I saw you. I haven't heard you yet. Hello, I am. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes, I can hear you. Thank you. Welcome. Hello. So, do you have slides you want to share? Yeah, just, just a few. Okay, that's cool. So, you should be able to share your screen, I believe. Right. There I'll you share. go. Can people see that? Great. Um, Okay, so uh, the, the background on this is that um, Vent is formerly a, a separate component that got merged into the Barrow code base. Um, it runs its own service um, and it has had some new features added recently. So first of all, what is it? It is a, uh, a SQL mapping layer. So I think pretty much anyone I know who's worked with the blockchain has ended up building something that does something a bit like this. Um, but the basic idea is it takes data that are in your smart contracts and it maps them uh, into SQL tables. Uh, and those tables are treated as read only. Um, so it's a, it's a query view essentially um, over the data. Um, and it's not all the data will come on to how you define your domain model. Um, and it supports Burrow. So Burrow has a gRPC event stream um, and uh, it also now supports Ethereum. Um, and it's able to do that because there's a common uh, definition of events shared between Burrow and Ethereum because they're both EVM based. And yeah, so I mean, broad, broadly, the idea is that once you're into a, a database and Postgres and SQL are supported, um, 
you can you can query much more quickly than you could do uh, natively querying the the Merkle state of the of the chain. Um, so the basic idea is that you emit some solidity events. So if you program in solidity um, events, are uh, fill a few niches, uh, but they're essentially uh, they operate uh, as things that you can fire. They're serialized as if they were function calls, um, and they are stored in the blockchain state. They're actually much cheaper in terms of the gas cost to store events than um, uh, to store in, in contract storage. They're also a lot nicer to use in some ways because um, you can't actually get the return value of an externally called function in Solidity, but you can see the events that were generated in, in, a, in a call path. So it's quite a nice way of providing a coarse grain execution trace. Um, and that coupled with the fact that it's a lot cheaper, you'll find that some contracts like the exchanges and so on have most of their state in events. The slight caveat to events is that in principle, the chain is allowed to clean up very old ones. Um, in practice, I think a lot of chains don't do this. Um, so Vent will sit there and it will listen to these events and it will create SQL tables for you. Um, and at any point you could, you could listen to all the events again and get the SQL tables back. Um, but I'm jumping the gun here a bit. So you emit Solidity events, um, you define some SQL table projections. When Vent starts up, it runs as a service, it will read the projections, build tables that, um, that map those uh, and represent those projections. And as it runs, it will take the stream of events and map them into rows of a table. So just to give you some flavor, perhaps people haven't written Solidity here. Um, this is what an event looks like. Um, you've got the type, the indexed column um, describes that certainly in Ethereum land, an indexed, uh, an index field, I should say, rather than a column, is something that you can filter by a topic branch. So the low level opcodes for events are these log zero to log four um, opcodes. And these uh, are able to emit an event with a different number of what they call topics. So there's typically a bloom filter over these in say mainline Ethereum. So if you put anything into an ind indexed um, field, you can get a quick, uh, quick access over a large range of blocks. Um, uh, and pull out those events. So that's useful, obviously, if you're looking for a needle in a haystack amongst all the different contracts, you can filter on the, the, the contract address, but also on the on the field. So th there's various design patterns using these, these index fields. So there's an update event there, and you can call the events whatever you like, but um, it's indicative of this event will um, cause a table to be updated. Um, and the one below is the deletion event, but I'll come on to the two modes that uh, event can operate in. So a projection looks something like this you have a table name that will be created. Now you can have multiple projections um, going into the same table. Um, and you might want to do that by, if you want to give them a different filter. So a projection can have a filter. There's a little um, peg grammar query language here that allows you to filter on events and other metadata coming through. So you can pick out particular events. You can aggregate multiple events into a single table um, and you can use multiple projections to, to do some quite interesting things. Um, there's kind of a, a bit of an implementation detail that leads through here, something we could tidy up a bit actually now that we, we have some uh, extra metadata, but the delete marker field, what this says is if I get a field whose name is underscore underscore delete, I'm going to treat that as the delete. So we basically have the, the CRUD operations here because um, when we get to the, to the modes, you can operate in a, in, a, in a mode where you update tables, the upsert mode or the log mode. Um, and the primary keys determine here what will happen. So um, if we get a match on primary keys, what we'll do is we'll do an upsert to an existing um, column. So this gives you the, the, the kind of basic, the, the, the basic things you need to map stuff going on in a Ethereum based chain to um, stuff that you can understand from, and this is the way we use it, a more traditional um, uh, JavaScript TypeScript based API that, that spends most of its time looking at the database. Um, so that's projections. And then you get tables. So this is a simplified view of the, the tables you might get out of the uh, projection I just showed there in the events. Uh, chain metadata is quite abbreviated. And this is quite a powerful feature of, of Vent and the fact that this is based off a blockchain that has this, this heartbeat and total ordering. You've got things like the index, the TX index, the height, the transaction hash, a bunch of metadata often bigger than the table that describes the last update that happened to that row. Um, and that can allow you to do some interesting things, which I'll come to. But um, perhaps I should reorder this. So 
yeah, in terms of the modes, if you give some primary keys, it, it operates in what we call view mode. So the view is, a, is kind of a, a realized view over that projection. Um, and it will, it will upsert uh, those, those rows where there's a match on the primary keys. If you give it no primary keys, then it operates in a different mode, which is an append only mode, which is very nice for event driven systems uh, and creating a log. Um, so for example, we use this to build something that's a bit like, you know, if you think about what Kafka does, it uses Zookeeper to, to have a, uh, uh, to, to do consensus basically. Um, and that allows it to guarantee exactly once delivery. Well, we can have reliable exactly once delivery with crash, crash tolerance by using the fact that the blockchain has done the hard work of creating the, um, the, the sequence number. Uh, it's a vector of, of, of height TX index event index. Um, and so, so that's what we often use the log mode for. Um, and like I say, uh, switching between these modes is implicit in whether you've got the primary key um, field in the projection here. So for example, this is a view mode projection. Um, yeah, so just about dom the domain modeling, like the, the most obvious analogy would be a sort of object to relational mapping. Now this isn't something where we just take every contract and take all of the, the, the data stored in a contract um, and put it into tables. It's an explicit intermediate layer of modeling that we're doing. So we're defining some events that we sort of care about emitting, which we, we might listen to in other ways, uh, not just built for building tables, but they kind of define the core state machine that we're representing. And then we put, we're mapping that stuff. So I don't know, it's not exactly object, event, event to relational mapping, um, but it's kind of interesting to work with that layer of indirection I found, um, uh, just because it kind of makes you structure your domain model in quite a nice event driven way. So features, yeah, we've got uh, what I call block stamping. I'm not even sure that's a, a term or a good term, um, but that's just the idea of the metadata. You've got a very uh, strong uh, vector clock running alongside every every uh, every line in your tables, and you can do useful stuff with that. That um, that, that is kind of the benefit of having this being driven by a blockchain. Um, uh, so you can update projections if you want to uh, redeploy. The source of truth is is the chain. You don't have to back up your database. You can if you like, if, um, but it can pretty quickly chew through um, fairly long chains, lots of events, and rebuild the tables. Now, if you want to change your um, your table model, um, but keep your event model the same, then that's perfectly doable. You can update um, your tables, maybe split them into separate ones, whatever. So there's quite a lot of uh, kind of nice refactoring you can do um, uh, using the projections as leverage, which is uh, somewhat more automated than if you were doing database migrations, for example. Um, and you can rewind and replay state. Um, so one way we need to use this is uh, for chain reorganizations on mainline Ethereum um, or, or for short-lived forks, we need the ability to go back to a previous state and that's all embedded. We can replay from the chain itself. And there's also a, a, a log uh, structure in a, in a system table that can allow you to do that more quickly within the database. Um, yet yeah, you can do deletion, the CRUD stuff I've touched on. Um, so we've got Postgres and SQLite support. Um, SQLite support requires CGO, so you are pulling in um, the CA, uh, ABI into your, uh, your builds, but if you have to do that, it's quite a nice embedded option. And uh, Postgres is, is, is just great. Um, uh, we also have support for Postgres notifications. So if you look here, there's um, notify uh, arrays. These elements of those arrays are the channels, and that says, if there is an update to this field, emit um, a JSON serialized version of the, the insert up the upset that happened on these channels. So on the meta channel and key meta channel. So this allows you to have um, listeners uh, when they're attached as, as Postgres clients, um, which can be useful for a bunch of things. And yes, yeah, so the, the new thing that kind of prompted me to try and bring it to a bit of a bigger audience was that um, relatively painlessly we've, we've been able to add ethereum support and the way we're trying to use this is playing into a kind of beacon oracle use case where we're listening to some contracts on mainline ethereum and building tables and the nice thing is we've been able to blend our um our burrow and our uh the, our kind of proprietary api and ethereum into a into a, a single kind of domain model using projections as the intermediate point um 
it works very similarly. It, it, it doesn't have a gRPC stream, so it has to do some batching and stuff, but it, it uses the, uh, the default Web3 um, or the standard Web3 JSON RPC, and the call is this ETH get log. So that will pull down some filtered logs. Um, and we were able to, um, to, to define a, an interface for a, a chain that is, I mean, it's, it, it, it does have an Ethereum core to it, but it's relatively minimal that allows you to um, add support in event for other chains if they could support something that was sufficiently similar to a Servity event. Um, uh, another note on synchronization. So when we've got, um, uh, we're making writes into the chain and we're reading from the database, often what we want to do is make sure that the last write that we made has hit the database. It doesn't take long, but you can have synchronization issues um, if you don't check that. So Vent and the, the JavaScript library that Vent has ships with a helper for this, which basically will, um, once you attach it, it will wait for a uh, for, for the vent to report that a high watermark in terms of block height has been reached before it returns, it will block. And this gets organized into a construct here. So with this contracts.do call, this lexical block, the function inside will, will only exit once um, event is synchronized to whatever the return value was from the last contract call. Um, and that's being captured kind of implicitly by this vent listener. But basically the point is there are some helpers that make sure that you can wait until the last write to the blockchain has hit the database. Um, <coughs> so yeah, in future work, um, it was kind of pleasing to see how easily the uh, chain interface dropped out. I was tempted to share it, but it's gonna be big on the slides, but um, you can see it in the in the, the vent folder of, of Burrow. Um, it would be kind of interesting, particularly with other EVM-based chains. Um, I mean, it would work out the box now with anything that supports Web3. Um, there might be more efficient um, RPCs available, but uh, it would be interesting to see it work with other chains. So, I mean, it should work with Bezu now, for example, without any more work. But uh, yeah, seeing the chain implement, uh, interface implemented would be would be interesting. You would need to have some comparable thing to an event but that potentially could be mapped to a function call. Um, uh, some other work, yeah, <laughs> supporting things like JSON, um, uh, what do they call them? Not aggregate type, complex process types like a, arrays and objects and stuff like that um, would, would be quite useful. Um, also things like being able to generate views that are based on multiple tables or generated columns and include them in the projections. There's a bunch of things, but it's so far been quite a practical tool um, is what we've found. So I just wanted to, to kind of uh, make people a bit aware of it and I'll, I'll share these slides. Um, but yeah, if you're using Web3 anywhere, um, please, please consider, consider it if you have a need for uh, SQL mapping. And that's all. All right, thank you, Silas. So, I mean, again, I mean, the, the reason we take the time to do this is not just, you know, for on the culture, although this is always good to do, uh, but, you know, although this is a component that was developed as part of the Burrow project, the belief is that it might be of use to other projects. And so, you know, Silas was hoping that by socializing a little bit more, letting people know what it's about, you know, it would trigger interest and possibly collaboration with other projects that could pick it up and use it. So... Uh, is there any questions from anybody for Silas? Or, or comments? I mean, any reactions? Anybody saying, hey, yeah, this looks cool. Maybe we could use it. Dano. Um, does using that mean we have to use the whole uh, Burrow package or is it something smaller that falls out of Burrow? Um, yeah, it's a, it's a good question. So it's it's um, there's no uh, code firewall between the other borrow code. So there's there's some shared packages that um, Vent use uses that, that live in Burrow, um, particularly things like the ABI, um, which is the the Ethereum ABI that uses uses to decode events. It is a completely separate, um, completely operated thing. So it runs you run Burrow Vent start. Um, so yeah, you, you, you cop the, the binary size of, of Burrow. You shouldn't be exposed too much to bits of Burrow you don't use. You don't have to run Burrow for sure. Um, it, it runs as its own, uh, its own path. 
um, like I say, it, it was it was kind of more of a mono repo play to bring it in um, because there was you know, there was tended to be quite a bit of dependency between the two. Um, it's not impossible to split it out. Um, it, it would need to justify the the added development effort, but um, yeah. I mean, it's a it's a pure Go binary unless you build with SQLite. So, uh, hopefully, it would be relatively um, uh, like low dependency outside of that. You know, it's a single static binary; it doesn't require any other borrow stuff. There's a reason I'm asking is I think that there's probably space for Hyperledger to grow beyond just pure DLTs and building stuff that help people who use DLTs do useful things independent of the DLT. So I see you have mentioned that you have other change on future work. Um, so I, I think this is this is interesting. I don't know if I'll have the time to help contribute to it, but I think directional wise, I think it could help, um, you know, it ease the day of, of blockchain developers who might need to integrate this sort of recording, the reporting functionality into traditional systems. I think there's a lot of space that we as Hyperledger could look into to, the, to help the developers do their job without requiring they go straight to the DLT for their work. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, the the, the the area that's kind of interested me, and it's, it's quite early in describing it in this way, but you know, if you think of layer two or state channel type things, um, I mean, that's kind of how we're using Burrow here. So if, if we if Ethereum is our main net, um, we are keeping a bunch of our state off on a on a on a side chain, and we've got this. Uh, at, this, at the moment, one-way communication, but you could consider Burrow running here as a, as a kind of state channel. So it's, it's kind of nice for them to, I think, to co-evolve, but they are, yeah, they're, they're quite distinct in, um, in their dependencies, at least. Um, yeah. Layer two is super hot in Ethereum right now. So I'm very familiar with a lot of those questions and concerns, to be honest. Yeah. We, we do have a question uh, from chat from Greg to get says it's Ethereum centric, isn't it? It is um, Ethereum centric insofar as um, the events are. So um, not to say that you couldn't codecify the events um, and kind of abstract them. I don't think that would be necessarily too hard. It depends what the concepts are, but in other chains, I'd say that fairly core to the design is the, the idea that there are events. Um, Right now, those events come from two different types, two, two RPC calls, but they are decoded using uh, the, same, the same encoding, which is, uh, which is the event, um, uh, the ABI encoding from, from Ethereum. Um, so so <coughs> there's, extra, there's a bit of extra work to do if you wanted to uh, put this onto a chain that didn't serialize its events like that. And like no other, no other sane chain would serialize its events like Ethereum unless it had to. So um, yeah, but I don't think that would be that hard um, if you have an event notion to map it to this. Oh, thank you for answering my chat question. Pleasure. Any, anyone else? Any questions or comments? Looks like not. Uh, Grace. Yeah, uh, just wondering if you will share the presentation and like the link to the repo and stuff. Uh, I think definitely Grace will like to explore it a little more. Yes, yes, I will. I'll push. I'll push the presentation up and I will drop it in the TSC list and chat in a sec after this. Yeah. Okay, and, yeah, we could probably put the links from the agenda as well on the record of the meeting. So makes it easy for people to find it. Yeah, if you have a PDF, uh, either yeah, email it to me or just drop it in the in the TSC minutes, that'd be awesome. Yeah, no, I can generate a PDF off this. This is, this is what you're looking at now is HTML if you prefer, but yeah. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you. Okay, sounds like we're done with this. Thank you, Silas. All right, so with that done, we can move to the agenda item, I mean, the agenda section about discussion items. So the first one 
uh, is in relationship with the uh, report we got from Bezu, in which they brought up the issue regarding DCO, which they see as a barrier to contribution. So I don't know, Grace or Dano, who wants to speak to this? Um, I'll take a stab at it. Grace might have a bit more context. But a lot of what we're seeing is there's some people who come in for their first contribution, usually in the docs repository. Um, they'll come and they'll do a contribution. Um, they won't find tooth comb read contributing.md and read about the DCO and the flags on CLI because pr they're probably using something like Visual Studio Code or IntelliJ to just contribute their stuff easily. And or even the editor inside of GitHub, which doesn't support sign off. So they'll do their contribution, they'll get their PR, and then they'll get, get a big red X to it next to it that says, you don't have a sign off by line in your contribution PR. And you know, one of the docs maintainers will come in and say, hey, you know, can you run this in your on your side? It'll update it, you know, it's got force push and all that other stuff. And say, you know, here's here's you just need to copy and paste this line into your CLI. And we never hear from the contributor again. Um, to get, you know, the, to add this little bit of a barrier for some of these first time contributors is honestly too much. Um, so it's, it's really hard for us to grow up from anybody that's not a contributed enterprise developer who is, you know, very dedicated to try and get their changes in and push it through to the end. So it shortens, it makes it the tip of the funnel of getting new, you know, the open end of the funnel it closes a bit for trying to grow new contributors. Um, if their first experience is to say, hey, you didn't do all the style points right, so we're going to ding you for it because we have to. So one proposal that crosses my mind that might be useful is in the, because Basu we don't do merges, uh, we do squash merges where we take all their PR lines, we squash it into a single merge. Um, if the DCO requirements could be relaxed, that if within the PR, if they miss it, that's okay as long as in the comments they say, yeah, this is my contribution that meets the standard. Then when we squash merge it and put it in one merge and it has our DCO line, um, what, what lives in the final main line um, will have full DCR, DCO um, entries for what is actually shipped and published. And you can go back with traceability into the BR, PR and see the statement that yes, this is all covered by it. It's not necessarily in every single um, Git commit along the way that it gets the final step. Sorry, Gary. Uh, so I still don't fully, well, one, I, I like to understand the solution. Um, what if somebody only had a single commit Then who's it actually signed off by? But I, I guess I'd, I'd like to understand the, like, I'm not sure I have a problem with whatever the process, but, uh, or the, you know, if we have a clever solution or something like that, that everybody else agrees to, but have you actually ever talked to these committers and that's why they disappear? Because I don't get it, to be honest with you, right? I mean, look, when I was a rookie back in the day, right, I, you know, it happened. And I occasionally, I still forget to do it sometimes. I, you know, contributed to Node.js and a few other, you know, various other ones that all require sign off. And they come in and I get that. Okay, I pull it back down and I sign off and I submit it again. So I just struggle with that. We have, and yes, there's some of them that we have been able to get a hold of have said, yes, this is a negative experience, so I don't want to contribute anymore. And I think we need to be sensitive that some people are very enfranchised into Git, and there are some people coming in that we're trying to onboard and bring it to the system, who this is honestly their first experience and exposure to Git. And um, they've been using their own internal stuff, like you know whether it's Perforce or whatever CSV they're using still in their, in their uh, corporate repositories. So, to people who haven't run into this before, it's a very negative experience and it really sours our taste, you know, as opposed to people who've been doing it for, you know, years since the Linux Foundation did it in 2004. So in the case of a single repo, we still make a single commit, it still becomes a squash commit and they can add it in a line there. And in the comment stream, in the PR, they say, yes, I certify that this meets the DCO standards. So when we do the, the squash commit, we make sure the sign of line is in there as well. And if it, in that case, I would probably put my own sign offline because I got it from them. I got the certification from them and I'm the one also vouching for it for the DCO rules. Got it, okay. All right, I do. Brian was, is that up? 
Go, Brian. Uh, sorry, sorry. Hey, um, the uh, uh, Dano, your proposal does it require changes to the DCO check tool uh, in GitHub, or is it uh, simply a, a proposal for the way that you plan to manage that process? So, um, it, I don't know if it would be a change in the tool or the change in the integration for a PR. Um, a DCO, I mean, we still want the DCO failure to show up just to, to give a flag and say, hey, we need to have them DCO it. So if we could have a tool that could also check to see if there was a comment where they did the DCO line and everything for it. So there's tools, changes that we've done in the tool, but I think we could do it today just to say that this is not something that will block a PR. We can have the big red check, but there's Git configs where you can say DCO can fail and can still be checked in um, and still throw nice huge errors when it hits mainline. So it's more like a warning than a fa failure. And and so partly this is maybe a small tool change, but th your question about process is also, is it okay if the uh, maintainer accepting the pull request essentially vouches that, yeah, this is something that clearly the contributor is signing off on, they're, they're making a valid contribution by, um, and it's small enough that we should accept it. It's kind of a judgment call on their part to some degree, because they're accepting a bit of the legal risk, I guess, um, but for a doc change, that's clearly trivial. Is that kind of the, this is like a mix of a tool change proposal, but also a question around legal risk, but at the at the, kind of the edge. Right, right. Mostly on the docs, docs changes where we see it, but I'm sure in the future we'll see um, larger ones come in where they won't say, do you really want me to force push all these 27 changes because I forgot out of the first line. So there's, it'll be judgment calls, but it should be an option. I would be my request. I think the legal risk is low, and and uh, and so so worth doing if it improves the contrib first time contributor experience. Um, but let's just anything that requires a judgment call the, opens the prospect of somebody getting it wrong in, in a big way. So we just need to somehow have some guardrails or something, some something safe there. Thanks. Yeah, I have to say I'm sympathetic to this idea. At the same time, it's like, well, they better learn to do DCO sign offs. At some point, they are going to have to learn, or there is. You know they're gonna have a hard time everywhere anyway well in many places but let's go to the queue hot hey um thanks so i posted a comment on this about i guess probably a year ago sometime like that um, i asked about if we could possibly tie the dco to an lfid um, and i think there was going to be sort of yeah, there was a bunch of discussion on that. And I was just curious um, if the LF has sort of any updated uh, rules or comments um, or, or any sort of updated process for using the LF for DCO, because it seems like the simplest way to do it would be tie the GitHub to the LF ID and you sign the DCO once, and then you never have to worry about it again. Except now you, uh, you're you requiring people to get an LFID, which we've talked about. And you know some will say, this is another barrier you're putting in the way. But I think this is an easier barrier. And it's, you know, I, I don't think this is a big barrier. I, I would agree with you, but, but I honestly don't know. I'm just trying to be the devil advocate there. Let's no, it's yeah. totally fine, but yeah. It was to solve a different problem, which is the pseudonyms problem. Uh, I mean, related, related, but um, yeah, there hadn't, yeah. has not been any for, uh, movement on this just because I think we're still at the collection requirement stage. Yeah. One question I have is if you would do um, a DCO sign up, are you saying that all the stuff you contribute from that point forward will be DCO compliant? Well, because the one advantage I see of having them a DCO on every contribution is you're saying at least the scope for this, I'm certain, and they have to consciously think about it or, you know, have, have turned it on for their IDE project permanently. I mean, that's, that's one thing I think the lawyers might have issue with is that each DCO is a certification for each contribution. But I mean, if we can, if we can move it to where it's a CLA type sign up, that would make a lot of people happy. Tracy is next in the queue. Yeah, so I, I have a concern with the proposal, uh, the first proposal that Dano made, um, which is if you can't get them to come back and comment on the fact that they did D do DCO the first time, what what's going to make them come back and comment on the fact that yes, I'm okay with doing DCO? Um, I just feel like you're you're setting 
setting it up such that you're going to end up with legal um, concerns with the code and, you know, who contributed what and did they really sign off on this or not? Um, seems, seems to me if we were to take this approach, I would recommend going to the, the legal um, committee and having them actually sign off on this being the approach that is taken. Uh, it just, it seems a little bit um, like there could be issues in the future. It's not going to solve the problem of people who commit once and never come back. You know, DCO or not, we have people say, can you make this change? We never see it again. Um, but the barrier of getting someone to write a comment in GitHub to say, oh, yeah, I forgot to DCO it. Um, I certify that this makes the standards of DCO is a lot easier than getting them to boot up a command line, run a bunch of commands they've never seen it before, and then do a force push on their own private repository. So it's not going to solve all of it, but it's going to solve enough for the people that are willing to come back and interact with us, they get frustrated because they're not GitHub CLI wizards. Troy, and then uh, Sean has been trying to raise his hand and he's not able to. So, Troy. Uh, okay. okay. Yeah, I was writing my comments into the chat, but I thought I'd verbalize them as well. Um, I think my main concern here is on the tooling side, if DCO is not a required check, and then somebody just you know merges into the repo um, without a DCO on the commit. Um, does that mean the repo has to be fixed by an admin, or are the repo rules also changing? Um, and I was also commenting that um, when copyright headers get missed by tooling, um, that's already an annoying problem. So um, as much as possible, I like these things to be caught by tooling. Um, and I think the DCO is even more annoying than copyright headers because of the need to fix commits, if that's what we're saying, um, after the PR has been merged. All right, thank you, Tara. Sean? Sean, yeah. Um, hello, I just wanted to make the point that um, I've had a lot of discussions with developers about um, rebasing their commits and getting, getting their signs of correct. Um, even developers who are really competent and know how to use, um, uh, you know, how to write compilers. Um, so this isn't isn't just um, new developers. Um, uh, this is people who just struggle with Git who can be very competent. That's all I wanted to say. There are people smart enough to work on compilers and can do Git commit dash s. <laughs> well, no, no, I've often asked. Um, uh, contributors to uh, rebase the commits because what people tend to do is they write some change, then they find a bug, they, they add another commit and do some more changes and add another commit. And um, this is kind of like a pretty ugly um, Git history. So I'll ask users to um, squash their, their commits into sort of log logical commits. And rebasing is, is um, something people struggle with. Okay, but so that's a case where there are no solutions where they could put it in a comment on the PR would address their problem, right? Yes, because then I would be able to do a, a squash merge. Yeah, and they could, they would definitely know how to comment and say, yeah, sure, I'll put that in a comment. Yeah, exactly. Yes, and putting people off is something you, you don't want to do. You want to attract contributors. All right, Gary? Look, I'm just going to say it again, right? I mean, look, we, we, we continue to, I, I don't know why we continue to think that we're going to make everybody have to avoid some of the things that you have to do when you're going to become a contributor to multiple, many open source projects. I mean, okay, we moved from, you know, Garrett, which was a good move, right? We, we, we get rid of Garrett because, well, one, we didn't want to run it, and two, said, hey, you know, GitHub seems to be the thing that's out there that most other projects are using. So we moved to that. We, you know, we obviously have always had this community that code is supposed to be, you know, under Apache license. It has to be cleared. We do that. So we have the DCO. Like, I mean, look, I mean, if somebody finds something that facilitates it, I, I don't see how it helps. I mean, maybe you get one commit from somebody. Uh, what's going to say when they come back that, you know, they're not going to follow this, that they're going to still have this thing. I, I, just, I just struggle with this, this whole thing. And, and why is it always that it's, it's, and maybe, and I don't mean this as an attack. I mean, maybe we've lost them in the past um, and we just didn't know about it. 
But I, like, what is it that's special about the people contributing to best you that they don't want to do this? I, I, I apologize. I can't raise my hand, so I have to jump in here. Um, Go this, ahead. this is causing me heartburn right now in fabric documentation. We, we had a guy come in who was all full of, of fire and energy to start working on the Italian documentation. I tried to help him through getting this, this process working. He grew frustrated and I haven't heard from him in over a week. So it's not just Bezu. Oh, okay. well, good, thanks. <laughs> But again, my point still stands. I don't get it. Look, it's a world that's out there. I didn't know how to use Git when I first did it. I contributed to a project. I did it. I, I just, I, I struggle. There's certain things that you have to do, and they don't seem that they're that, 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 that they're that hard to me. I, I get the first commit thing. I'm good. You know, that's as long as that passes the muster. But it just seems they're trying to baby and coddle people on stuff that they just have to learn to do. And I don't find that these are barriers when you have an entire vibrant ecosystem of people who contribute to stuff and they seem to get past this. All right. I think so, you're missing the people lower down that are helping them and guiding them along the way is what's going on. I mean, based on Rai's recent comments. Okay. Sure. But so I think, you know, Okay, so th there is, you know, we, we can't, I mean, we have to acknowledge there is an issue for some people, it creates a barrier. I, I you know, fundamentally, I agree with you, Gary, I feel the same, it seems very low to me, and I don't understand how people stop at that, get stopped by that. But, you know, if they do, they do. And if there is an easy solution, along the line of what Dano was talking about, maybe it's a, it's a low hanging fruit, we can just do it. And we can all continue to do our sign-offs the way we do it and have people who know better do the same. And then for the few people who don't, then if there is a way around that achieves the same result, which is the legal protection we're trying to get, you know, I don't really care how they get that we get there, right? So I would suggest that, you know, Dano, you put together your, you write down your proposed solution if the way to, auto, to make that automatic, I, you know, if we achieve the same goal of having the legal protection, I don't know why we would reject it. So I, I'd like to move on, but I'll go to the queue. We can finish the queue. Arun. Hey, so I, I just like the comment which Tracy has brought up. She's asking the easiest solution could be to remind people when there is a PR as a template when we use GitHub temp PR templates, right? I like that idea. And another question which I had was, uh, so I'm trying to search that in Hyperledger Charter. I could not find in the website. So I'm probably looking through the wiki as well. Do we mention that DCU sign off is must for PRs or do we only mention that DCU sign off is must for commits in the repository? Maybe that's something open and that's why this question was brought up because what I understand from Dano is that they're okay to add DCO sign off just that they're not okay to do it at the time of PR is raised and it Dano what suggests I mean what from what I understand if I'm not misunderstanding is Dano says that maintainers would take responsibility of making sure that uh, DCO sign off is must before it gets merged did, did I understand it correctly yeah, so I think you understood it correctly, but I think the one the one tweak, we can't just put it in the PR template because it's not checking the PR text, the template text. That's a separate set of text that comes in separate from the stream of commits that are pushed up as well. So they've made their commits before they even see GitHub to post the pull request. Now, if a sign off in the pull request would be sufficient, um, to match the stream, then that basically is what I'm proposing. If, if a sign off in the PR statement or in the comment stream is accepted to cover the commits that are coming in from Git itself. Right now, the tooling only checks Git itself. So I'm not saying I don't want them to do DCOs. I just want more flexibility as to where they can do the DCO. Sure. So probably, I, I guess I'll go with Brian's answer that we need and, and also Tracy brought that up. We need legal legal team's recommendation to understand what should be the better approach. Um, 
Yeah, and, yeah. and I'm happy to take a proposal uh, and get internal LF uh, legal guidance on it first to see if it's something that uh, does really need kind of the hyperledger legal committee uh, to to understand and approve. Uh, the LF internal legal team's really familiar with Git and and contribute <laughs> all those all those mechanics. So so I think yeah, I'm happy to carry that forward with them, uh, Dan. If we, if we get to a concrete proposal around this. Okay, so something on the Hyperledger wiki, and I forward you the the proposal page for it. Exactly. That'd be great. Thank you. All right, let's move on for today. But uh, I'm glad we had this discussion. We have a clear action item and uh, the way forward. So let's switch topic and go back to Ripple Inter, which we're still experimenting with. There are more and more projects that I believe are trying it out. And uh, meanwhile, uh, Rai has been trying to push it. And, and you know, after a first attempt of going to every repo and add that to the CI, he eventually gave up on that and created his own, uh, his own report, which encompasses all the repositories for the labs and the projects. So, Right. Why don't you tell us more? Uh, sure. Uh, here's the repo. It's RL report. Um, the code is in here. They're GitHub Actions. Uh, I ran it on all the repos in both labs and main. Uh, Brian pointed out that there should be an easy summary page. So here it is. This is a very simple grep. Um, there's nothing tricky here. Uh, so it's here. I don't run it. It's a GitHub action, you know, I just ran it. I'm not running it every day or anything, but uh, it's pretty easy to do. All right. So in the meantime, I saw Troy was talking about Ripple Inter and some of its deficiencies the way it is today, especially with regard to languages that doesn't necessarily handle well, like Go. I mean, Troy. You want to speak up to this? Yeah, sure. I mean, it doesn't break the basic rules, but um, there are a couple of rules that are in that rules file that um, are clearly only targeting JavaScript right now. Um, you can see it by the file paths and by the language check. Um, so for example, um, the copyright headers check is not actually being run on the Go repos right now from the existing people venture rules. Um, so in one of the repos I maintain, I did add that. Um, but then I also had to add some exception rules for like generated files and things like that. So um, just FYI that um, when you see the repo linter report, um, these other languages don't have all the warnings that they would have had if those paths were properly enabled. But so this is why I was hoping that we would all contribute to improving the one uh, config file that is shared by everybody or that is offered to everybody, I should say. And uh, I mean, is there any reason we couldn't make some of the changes you've made for your own repo to everybody, to, to, to the common file? Um, yeah, so I, I, I plan to add for the copyright headers, um, the go paths. Um, I'd also suggest ignoring generated files, uh, at least with some basic rules. Um, this kind of relates to the DCO comment as well that uh, I kind of prefer errors on copyright headers, but it's kind of very difficult on a very generic file like this to enable that, which effectively means running repo linter twice on those repos, like this very generic set of rules, and then maybe a more specific one. Yeah. Yeah, and we talked last time about looking into if there was a way to have a local config file to override the common one. I haven't, I actually meant to look into this and completely forgot and didn't have time. I don't know if anybody has looked into that. Yeah, like you said, my, my, my plan would be um, uh, pr probably have this very basic repo linter that's just looking for the basic files um, and then run it a second time. Um, um, unless we do like a script that's like combined two files together or something like that. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. I mean, we could do it in two passes if we can't have 
some kind of combined config file. All right. Any other comments or questions? I mean, this is the work in progress. I just thought, you know, what Rai did was interesting. And uh, I wanted to highlight that so that uh, we'll get a chance to stay on the, stay up to date on the status of this. All right, so we have a few minutes left. left. Um, Arun brought up in the, in the email in response to my posting the agenda to the mailing list that he, he was uh, hoping he would have time to bring up an issue or it's actually with regard to the implementation of a decision that was made earlier. So Arun, the floor is yours. You have eight Thanks minutes so left. Let's try to make use of it. Yep. Thanks, Arnold. Uh, sure. So we have a vibrant community in India of, and and recently, I mean, we even formed a student society where all the students from across country can join in and then learn together or maybe we share contribution opportunities. So now that we have a big set of people who are interested in, in contributing in some way, it could be for multiple reasons that they are trying to build up their profiles or in, it could be whatever reasons, right? So um, one of the thing which we are being asked regularly, at least in the last few weeks is how can they start and contribute? And most of them are saying that meetings which they see for uh, let's say fabric or salt tooth or any other thing, it's pretty late for India time means. So one of the thing which these, I mean, um, it was again brought up in today's call in Hyperledger India chapters weekly meeting. And then I told them, hey, recently there was a decision done in the TSC, which was uh, to aggregate all the issues in one confluence page per project and separate them by, by tags, right? For example, good first issue, or this is something which may not require expertise on the project. Anybody can pick it up. So when I told them that this was made and they were excited, they were all happy and happy to know about it and they wanted to start on it. And that's what I wanted to bring up in today's call as well, if I'm permitted. I would like to know next step of implementation. And in fact, there are people who are willing to volunteer if it takes any documentation or any kind of effort from them as well. All right, thank you. And you know, I would add to this, I mean, the call I missed and where Tracy, the Tracy chair, you guys talked about you know, different ways to try and break the silos. And there were a lot of ideas that were thrown in. The question then is like, okay, but we need to implement those. And this is one of them, right? And uh, I think we kind of, you know, fail sometimes on these things where, you know, we have good ideas that get brought up and then nobody acts on them. So nothing comes out of it. And so this is a call for action. They're actually ready to work on it, not just, waiting for somebody else to do the work. So what can we do? Or what do you, what do you think you, they need, Arun, to start working on it? As far as I'm concerned, I'm happy to let them have a crack if they want to take a, to do it. Sure, so I think the proposal does not mention details of how we should proceed. It rather says that this should be done, like for example, tagging should be done, but how do we make use of it? And, how do we proceed from there is not mentioned anywhere. So probably if that is still an open question, I would probably go back and probably send a mail to mailing list in India chapter and ask them, um, hey, it is still open and these are the first set of action items, do ABC kind of tasks. So let them come back with a proposal and, and if we can share a confluence page space and let them identify a tool, like figure out how to read from GitHub and list them. So that could be first step. And probably from there, a few other people can get motivated and see, okay, these are the available contribution opportunities. Why don't I start with this issue? I feel comfortable in Go language, for example. Um, so yeah, that's what I was thinking if there were no implementation plans. Okay. And I'm happy to lead if required. Arun, this is David. So this is great. I'm glad that there are some things that we could do that will help address the time zone issue and help make 
community, you know, in other parts of the world, you know, at different time zones feel more connected and more empowered to contribute. Uh, and I think going back to them and, you know, asking them to, you know, work on a prototype sounds great. I have a couple of thoughts and I can show you a couple of things that might be useful to share with them. So if you want to talk offline, I can help put an email together that you can send to the community there. That would be great. Thanks, David. All right. I see, but I'm not so calm, suggested. It's, it's a query which we can do on GitHub. Yeah. Right. No, that's, and otherwise, I mean, does anybody know already how to implement this? I, as far as I understand, there was no specific plans on how to implement it or who would do be doing that, right? Well, in terms of an aggregator, I think there was something that we had done before that does integrate uh, GitHub issues, specifically tag the ones tagged good first issue into a page on a wiki. So, I mean, I think that could be a starting point to show what we could do. It's only pulling it from one specific repo, but I mean, it does at least show how you integrate, you know, tagged issues onto the wiki. We just need to do that and apply it to more repos, I think, and then figure out the right way to present it on a wiki page. So here, I'll drop that in the um, channel. All right, that's great then. So David, we'll leave it to you to follow up with Arun, or you know, he will follow up with you. And if you guys need any input from the TSE, of course, come back. But for now, we'll consider that you know, you guys are on point to try and, you know, make us make progress on that one. Yeah, I'm happy to do that. Arun, whenever you like to talk, just ping me. I, I think part of this is the mechanics of that. Part of it is also um, whether the TSC feels um, like asking or, or, you know, nudging or something more forceful than that uh, uh, to the projects to identify such good first issues. That's, that's harder work. That's hard for, you know, David or Arun or any outsider to do. It's something that maintainers really are only sure. really but in theory okay, if we can go ahead or no 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 it's okay good i was just going to say in theory this is an incentive though for a project to do it if we could provide exactly. a pool of people who want good first issues that would be in theory you know hopefully yeah. projects will take advantage of that okay. yeah that's very much in line with what i meant to say it's like you know if we can show a hey, look if you tag your issues in such and such a way, they will appear there and you know, you'll know you have more people looking at them and they be able to find them and help out. That should be an incentive, so I agree. All right, I think we are just about on time, so let's leave it at this. I'm glad we had a chance to tackle that as well. Um, this, I'm gonna close the call. Thank you all for joining and we'll talk again next.